Everywhere you look, every channel you flick past, every magazine you flip through, you're never far away from some story about Britain's royal family. Now, the royal family is threatening to give Prince Andrew the boot from his royal... back. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are sitting down for their... Today's British royals sit at a strange crossroads between ancient tradition and modernity. Part tabloid fodder, part symbolic relics of a once almighty empire. The crown is a symbol of permanence, of stability, of continuity. In many ways, the royal family are the original influencers. And whatever they're up to, one thing is clear. The media is obsessed. The breaking story involving the royal family and this photo. So we'll show Kate's you. Photoshop fail. What were the Prince and Princess of Wales thinking? Hello. Right now, on nearly every streaming service, you'll find multiple series covering the latest Prince Andrew scandal. The Crown is one of the most awarded TV shows in recent history. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have become global tabloid fixtures, and few will forget the media frenzies surrounding the deaths of the Queen or Princess Diana. And yet, this same family, now a modern goldmine for racy tabloid gossip, still has to assert itself as the noble and deserving pinnacle of British and Commonwealth life. Officially, the royals claim their role is not to fill up gossip columns, but instead to act as a focus for national identity, unity and pride, giving a sense of stability and continuity. But stability and continuity of what, exactly? In a recent poll conducted in the UK, when asked about what the monarchy says about Britain, the top responses were traditional and powerful, but right behind that, an unequal society. It's a paradox. The monarchy symbolises continuity and power, yet it also embodies inequality. And despite lacking any real political authority, the king remains deeply embedded in the rituals of governance. British monarchs, after all, haven't held meaningful political control for centuries, yet they still sign everything into law. And the King still meets with the UK Prime Minister every week to discuss policy. They no longer rule over an empire, yet more than 100 million people around the world still have King Charles of Britain as their head of state. His face is printed on coins and banknotes, and his portrait still hangs in post offices at all points of the globe. It's confusing, right? And now King Charles's crowning moment, the first of two crowns to be placed upon his head. If you watched the King's coronation in 2023, you and millions of other viewers witnessed a ceremony steeped in opulent traditions dating back to 1066. Under the lofty vaulted ceilings of Westminster Abbey, Charles wore a priceless crown crafted in 1661 and was anointed with holy oil from a spoon dating back to the 12th century. His belt, made of gold and silk, was also worn by his ancestors during their coronations. Other monarchies have done away with such lavish displays of pomp and ceremony, deeming them outdated, but the British cling resolutely to tradition. These public displays, after all, are a way to signify stability and continuity. Or, as a British journalist said in 1867, the more democratic we get, the more we shall get to like state and show. But of course, not all traditions are cherished equally. Because in other parts of the world, there are many elements of the British monarchy's storied past that they're less keen to dwell on. Before they'd even landed, protesters were gathering outside of the British High Commission demanding that Prince William apologise for the role played by the royal family in slavery. By the 20th century, the British Empire, led by King Charles' forebears, controlled one quarter of the world's landmass, from Ireland to North America, the Caribbean and India and, of course, Australia. That vast and bloody empire didn't really end officially, it just changed. But as even more former British colonies gain independence, many have yet to confront the British crown over the injustices and turmoil inflicted in their name. We're talking about dispossession of land, the slave trade, the prolonged subjugation of millions of people, starvation, disease, violent suppression of rebellions, native rights, and the grand larceny of trillions of dollars in minerals and resources across the globe for hundreds of years, all to line Great Britain's pockets. Then, in the 20th century, as the power of almighty empires waned, 
It seemed like Britain's ruling class might finally be forced to reckon with its past and pay for its alleged crimes. And yet, nothing really happened. People were just expected to move on from history. After all, it's difficult to prosecute the crimes of the past and decide who should pay for what. But when does history really end? The British royal family are yet to apologise for any of the harms of empire conducted in their name. Instead, they've used all kinds of linguistic gymnastics to get around it. From the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our history, the people of this island forged their path with extraordinary fortitude. But the reality is the rivers of gold that flowed from colonial outposts all over the world to Great Britain over the centuries formed the bedrock of so much of the wealth and tradition that King Charles and his royal institution still rest upon. The impacts of colonisation are intrinsically linked with the crown, whether the royal family wished to admit it or not. The very same suffering that shaped those colonial legacies, even if not directly ordered by him, allows King Charles to open the UK Parliament in the modern day, wearing a crown consisting of 2,868 diamonds, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds and 269 pearls, all set in silver and gold mounts. My government will govern in service to the country. My government's legislative programme will be mission-led and based upon the principles of security, fairness and opportunity for all. King Charles is now in Australia on his first official visit as monarch, a man who says he's dedicated his life to conservation, fighting climate change and has also acknowledged the impacts of European settlement on Indigenous people. From Australia, he'll travel to Samoa, representing the Commonwealth, an association of 56 countries that the royals tout as working towards shared goals of prosperity, democracy and peace. Yet most of the countries in the Commonwealth are only linked by one thing, their former control by the British Empire. When King Charles arrives in Samoa, he's expected to face a demand from Caribbean and African nations, a staggering 200 billion pound bill for the damages caused by the British Empire. All this from the very countries he claims to be working towards shared prosperity with. But some say even that staggering figure isn't enough. Barbados alone, an island just 34 kilometres long, has a harrowing colonial past. Its Prime Minister, Mia Motley, believes the Caribbean nation is owed $4.9 trillion by slave-owning nations. Neo-colonialist structures that perpetuate and reflect an old world order characterized by racism and classism and misogyny. And it is for this reason that the Caribbean community joins the growing chorus to complete the unfinished work and address the matter of reparations for slavery and colonialism. UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer has come out saying, we do not pay reparations. And the reaction was red hot from the more reactionary elements of the British media. Leading United Nations judge Patrick Robinson says the UK can no longer ignore the greatest atrocity and should pay over 18 trillion to 14 countries for its involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. In 2023, the same judge who presided over the trial of former Yugoslavian leader Slobodan Milosevic for crimes against humanity estimated that Britain's debt for its role in the transatlantic slave trade amounts to around $24 trillion. And even that, he warned, was an understatement. That figure is around six times the size of the British economy. I can't accept the argument that it was a long time ago. It may have been a long time ago, but there are obviously current day consequences from the practice of transatlantic chattel slavery. Of course, some parts of the community still claim that the British Empire was a force for good, that the UK's institutions and technologies were the balance to the horrors of colonial rule. No white men were going inland and capturing slaves. They were purchasing slaves sold to them by the African chiefs uh, of, of Western Africa. So if Britain is being asked to pay for slavery, then obviously people in Nigeria should also be paying for slavery. However, the royal family refused to take on this issue in any meaningful way. 
The contradictions are endless and the implications of the whole issue are overwhelming. The questions are huge and the answers are almost impossible to pin down. But one question stands out. If tradition is so important to the British royal family and their continuity is so crucial to the character of Britain, why are they so bad at talking about their own history? I'm Emma Hoy, and you're listening to Leave It to the Experts. As King Charles and Camilla touch down in Australia, the rising tide of history, conversations about reparations and restorative justice that are set to crest at the Chogham meeting, seem nowhere in sight. Well, in just over 24 hours, King Charles and Queen Camilla will touch down in Australia for their long-awaited royal tour. On any view, it's a historic visit and it's worth taking note. The most pressing concern about the visit to Australia so far have largely surrounded questions over how the trip will impact King Charles' yeah, cancer Charles, treatment. I mean, it, do, it does raise some sort of interesting speculative questions about uh, what King Charles' treatment might be. And when you've got a flight across the globe down into the southern hemisphere, you can sort of understand why he might be uh, suspending his treatment, of course. And then there's the question of whether Australia should remain part of the constitutional monarchy. That debate seemed settled in 1999 when 54% of Australians voted to keep the British sovereign as head of state. And then the 2023 YouGov poll showed only one in three Australians now support becoming a republic as soon as possible. So what position does the royal family play in a modern Australia? And why has King Charles put aside his cancer treatment to visit Australia now? Let's ask our expert, Associate Professor Cindy McCreary from the University of Sydney. So, Dr. McCreary, what is the significance of this royal visit compared to others in recent memory? Well, Emma, I think this royal visit is significant for a number of reasons. Um, First and foremost, it's the first royal visit by the new sovereign. So this is the first visit that Charles has made since his accession to the throne in September September 2022. And in fact, it's also, I think, only the second overseas visit that he's made as king, the last being to France um, for the D-Day ceremonies in the European summer in June. So this is a big deal, and it's a big deal not just for Australia, but also for the king, who, of course, is making a royal visit in very much, you know, following in the footsteps, the huge footsteps of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. So although it's the 17th visit of Charles to Australia, as the first visit as king, it's really a big deal for him and he will want it to go as well as possible. We see Charles taking the throne at quite a challenging time for the monarchy Mm -hmm. in its history, especially, as you've said, following in those enormous footsteps of Queen Elizabeth II. What kind of monarch do you think King Charles is shaping up to be after his reign so far? Look, I think we saw an indication of the way that Charles wishes his reign to be seen in the festivities around the coronation, particularly at the end, the the very informal kind of street parades, dancing, music, involving community groups and members of the public, particularly British people, was very much part of Charles's mission to show himself as a people's monarch. He really wants to be seen as empathetic, as someone who is not all about airs and graces, who's not as formal as his mother, and who wishes to be seen as someone who can connect with ordinary people and the incredible struggles that many people around the world, but particularly in the Commonwealth, uh, as well as Britain itself, uh, face. How can the British monarchy, which is seen as the ultimate beacon of tradition and hierarchy, coexist with the idea of the Commonwealth as you know this collective of modern nations who are working together for mutual prosperity? Well, in fact, since the origins of the Commonwealth, you know, really um, for practical purposes since the end of World War II and the kind of mass wave of decolonization of the British Empire, in fact, it's always been the British monarch who has been the head of the Commonwealth. Now, that's not um, a, a necessary requirement. There's no reason that the head of the Commonwealth has to be the British monarch. It's not an inherited position. But nevertheless, the fact that George VI, then Elizabeth II, and now Charles III are head of the Commonwealth makes it seem as if that's a natural role for the British monarch. Um, and of course, the historical links between the British Empire, where of course, the British sovereign was head of state for much of the world, um, make it seem a reasonable fit for the British monarch to be head of the Commonwealth. The head of the Commonwealth role is incredibly important to Charles. And I think going forward, as more realms leave, um, uh, become republics, but nevertheless remain member states of the Commonwealth, and as the Commonwealth itself grows to absorb states which don't actually need to have any historical link with Britain. And we've seen, for example, former uh, 
West African colonies of France now joining the Commonwealth as republics. Uh, I think that Charles can see that that's the growth area for him uh, and for that for, for the sovereign to, as head of the Commonwealth rather than as uh, sovereign of a, a you know a declining number of realms. The trip's timing is coming at a really interesting time, just days after the anniversary of Australia's failed voice referendum. Um, many argue with great merit that Indigenous communities are still really feeling the impacts of colonisation. So what role does the British Crown believe they play in 2024 for events that they ultimately helped to kickstart, you know, 200 years ago? So this is a very complex and sensitive issue, and I think it's um, clear that, that Buckingham Palace and, and the King himself are very sensitive to this issue. Um, it has long been the case, at least since the 19th century and um, the time of the reign of Queen Victoria, that the British monarch has positioned themselves, whether fairly or unfairly, rightly or wrongly, as uh, someone who is empathetic with the position of Indigenous people and who is there as uh, a sounding board, a person to listen to their concerns. And certainly we have seen groups of Indigenous people appeal directly to the British monarch um, for justice. Uh, not necessarily with a great deal of success, but nevertheless, there is this idea that appealing directly to the monarch is an appropriate uh, forum and that the British monarch is there to listen. So during this visit, we can see that Charles and Camilla will be, again, listening uh, quite deliberately to uh, Indigenous uh, Australians. Uh, they will be, uh, for example, visiting the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Memorial as part of the Australian their visit to Canberra, um, they will be meeting with Indigenous groups. But I think the key here is listening. I think that we won't see the monarch making any broad or uh, you know, really important statements. It's more about listening to the concerns of Indigenous Australians. So looking forward, one of the major issues that will be brought up at the next Commonwealth meeting is the idea of reparations for some of these damages that were caused by the British Empire over the centuries. And it's a complex issue, but how... At this stage, does the British royal family position itself in that debate? I mean, we're talking about a legacy that was acted out in their name, which they continue to reap the benefits of today. Yeah, again, this is complex because it's very hard to disentangle the British monarchy and the British government. Um, and I think we need to be clear that the position of the current Labour government in Britain is exactly the same as that of previous Conservative governments in Britain, namely that they are not going to Chogham to discuss reparations. Um, Keir Starman, the Prime Minister, has made that very clear, uh, and that's echoing kind of long-standing British policy on this. And in fact, if you think about um you know, the issues of, of reparations. This, this is a really complex issue that involves, in my view, as a historian, not just uh, a government or a royal family or a monarchy, but also other institutions. Um, and indeed, we've seen, for example, uh, in the past, uh, large corporations like the insurer Lloyds of London um, being sued over the issue of their role in, in facilitating, um, you know, slavery and, and financing, um, uh, th those uh, those voyages. Uh, so, in my view, this is a very complex issue. I'm not sure that at Chogham this year we're going to see any concrete progress. Although I do agree that it's going to be a live issue because uh, this is a, a meeting which will determine the new Secretary General of of the Commonwealth. Uh, and I understand that all three of the leading candidates who happen to come from countries which have themselves historical links to to slavery and whose peoples have suffered slavery have all um, uh, voiced approval for the the concept of reparations, but whether or not there's going to be real meaningful moves forward when Britain's taking a very uh, sort of, you know, uh, clear rejection of that idea, I'm not sure. I think the role of the king is, as as he's made clear, is to express sorrow and to uh, to to absolutely un, um, acknowledge the hurt uh, and the injustice. Uh, but I don't think that the king or the monarch is any position to, in any way, be seen to be. Um, speaking on behalf of the British government. So I think actually that the, the monarch needs to constitutionally actually keep quiet here and listen um, rather than to offer concrete, um, a concrete program of reparations, for example. Uh, Dr. Cindy McCreary, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, Emma. The timing of the royals' trip comes at a particularly sensitive moment for many to be speaking and thinking about Australia's connection with the British Crown. Is there any sense of hope a year on from that huge loss for the voice proposal? And it was just such a 
a devastating blow. Just a year ago, Australian voters decided to reject the referendum to acknowledge Indigenous Australians as the original inhabitants of the country and to set up an advisory body that would help to assist government in shaping policy that would impact Indigenous Australians. The vote was an overwhelming no. We're much more divided as a nation uh, than what we were prior to the referendum. Uh, There were three pillars of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, voice, treaty, truth. But what I don't want to see is the weaponisation of truth-telling or treaty as we did with the voice. But throughout the lead-up to the voice referendum, the debate kept circling back to the British Crown and the legacy of empire. Here's Indigenous activist and voice campaign leader Noel Pearson speaking with one of Australia's top journalists on Possession Island, the very place where, in 1770, Captain James Cook claimed the east coast of Australia in the name of King George III. This is the place he planted the flag. The effect of what he did here and claiming possession on behalf of the British Crown it didn't have a legal effect. It had a. It, it was a political act. Mm. However, Pearson's claims to history are not representative of all. Fellow Indigenous advocate and Conservative politician Jacinta Price was harangued by many for her comments on the impact of the British in Australia. A positive impact, absolutely. I mean, now we've got running water, we've got readily available food. I mean, everything that my grandfather had when he was growing up, because uh, he first saw white fellows in his early adolescence. We now have. The price was roundly celebrated elsewhere for those comments by a predominantly white, politically conservative audience. Many, including Australia's current opposition leader Peter Dutton, believe that Indigenous recognition would put the rights of its Indigenous people above the rest of the nation. It will have an Orwellian effect where all Australians are equal, but some Australians are more equal than others. We have just heard every bit of dis- disinformation and misinformation and scare campaigns that exist in this debate. When Captain Cook claimed Australia for the British Crown, he also claimed the land belonged to nobody, under the term terra nullius, which meant the British could do as they pleased. It took campaigners until 1992 for that term and many of the implications it presented to be overturned by the Australian High Court. The Prime Minister of the day fielding oddly familiar questions. Uh, my question to the Prime Minister, I'd like to uh, actually ask him quite a few questions on Mabo, but just just a very broad question is, uh, Mr Keating, is why does your government see the Aboriginal people as a much more equal uh, people than the, white, the average white Australian? We don't. We see them as equal. Well, you might say that, but all the indications are that you don't. But, you, but I think that what's implied in your question is you don't. The question of responsibility within the Australian context has made some advances. At the turn of the century, then Prime Minister John Howard refused to apologise for the stolen generation, a practice of forcibly removing Aboriginal children from their parents across Australia. But in 2008, the Australian government finally accepted some responsibility. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these, our fellow Australians. Interestingly, Australia's current opposition leader, Peter Dutton, did not attend the apology in protest, a decision he now says he regrets. Yet the Stolen Generation apology is just one example of the impacts of colonisation and its lasting effects. Writing for 360 Info in January, the University of Sydney's Professor Lisa Jackson-Pulver, a Koori Aboriginal woman and an esteemed epidemiologist and public health practitioner, said that since the apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples offered by then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd on the 13th of February 2008, the history of this nation is no longer in dispute. The effects of the original act of Arthur Phillip and the Crown are still seen today in health outcomes, incarceration rates, out-of-home care, criminalisation of the effects of intergenerational grief, among others. The annual Close the Gap reports and commentary still show life disparities across health, employment, home ownership and educational attainment. As of 2021, the Australian government is paying a form of reparations to its Indigenous people, but only some. The Conservative Prime Minister Scott Morrison put aside $378 million Australian dollars to redress the human damage of the policy, including one-off payments of $75,000 Australian dollars for its victims. 
yet another example of how the scars of colonialism run deep. The architects of those original policies may be long dead, but their legacies live on. So who carries responsibility for their crimes? And what does real accountability look like? In the Australian state of Victoria, a truth commission is taking on those very questions. The Yorok Justice Commission is looking into the historic and ongoing systemic injustice experienced by our people in Victoria. Yorok is independent of government. It is a royal commission with strong powers, led by First Peoples. The Yorok Justice Commission will hear stories and gather information from First Peoples in Victoria on their experience of past and ongoing injustices and how their cultures and knowledge has survived. It will also seek evidence from the Victorian government and other institutions to uncover how policies past and present continue to impact Indigenous communities. But telling the truth is not enough. We must have change. Yuruk will deliver reports to the Victorian government and First Peoples Assembly of Victoria that will recommend changes to the system and laws affecting our people. The goal is a treaty between the Victorian government and the Indigenous nations inside its modern borders. But reconciliation isn't easy. And Australia's struggle with its past was on full display during the 2023 Voice referendum campaign. Before the vote, Professor John Evans from Swinburne University told 360 Info that regardless of the outcome, the road to reconciliation in Australia still had a long way to go. My name's John Evans. I'm the inaugural Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Engagement here at Swinburne University. Well, I think it's raised um, the spectre of racism and about Indigenous people's place in Australian society. I think um, you know, a lot of people are feeling a little bit hurt and wounded at the moment. Indigenous people's place in Australia with the No campaign is really being challenged and about uh, how they can make a contribution to matters that are going to affect their lives. So I think uh, the fact that it's been uh, so politically polarising, I think, is is contributing to sort of the effect on the well-being for many Indigenous Australians because like, we haven't really grasped what it means to Indigenous people to be involved in in the process of consultation and and being involved in things that are important to them. But also shows that you know, there's a large proportion of our population who still don't get the importance of working with Indigenous people to create change that's going to improve the lives of it. Australia's uh, Indigenous community. So I think it shows the lack of maturity and, and a, a lack of sophistication in where we've gotten to in terms of our, our desire to include Indigenous Australians. Well, I think the, the, general no, the general notion of reconciliation is important about understanding you know, where the country's been, uh, its impact on Australia's Indigenous population, and where is an Indigenous population we want to go in the future. You know, they need to engage with Indigenous Australians to understand what their future looks like. As I said before, we'll still have those challenges about what we want to do uh, in an institution like us and other institutions in improving uh, the socioeconomic conditions for Australia's Indigenous community. Yeah, and given that um, either the greatest thing that our does is speak the lag, what are some of the immediate things that we can change as a society and culture to make life better for Indigenous Australians? How do we do that? Well, I think the, the general notion of reconciliation is an important one and understanding how institutions can work much closely with Indigenous organisations and, and, uh, and to look at the capabilities that are in Indigenous communities and to work much more closely with them, uh, trying to get their voice as a, a, the little v on the issues that are affecting them. So that's what I guess the bigger voice is about, is that trying to get Aboriginal people to the table to talk about how they can be part of the, the solutions to many of the things that we're trying to get solutions to. So I think that's that's the, that's the, uh, the the important concept we need to be to keep dealing with. I guess institutions like us, you know, will still have the closing the gap targets to meet. We'll still have the challenges about what we want to do uh, in an institution like us and other institutions in improving uh, the socio-economic conditions for Australia's Indigenous community. Now, 12 months on from the referendum vote, Professor Tom Kalmer, one of the referendum's architects warns of Australia's backsliding in its relationship with Indigenous people. Coexistence, he says, remains a fraught and unfinished task. So 12 months on, what have been the consequences of Australians voting no to The Voice? 
Well, I think there's been quite a number of them. Um, you know, what, what we've found, and, and we've reported on this, is that there's been a higher level of racism and racial slurs, uh, both on social media and, and um, you know, quite openly. And it, it, it's, it's like as if people think that they've now got a licence to have a go. And, um, and that's changed since yeah. the referendum. Yes, it has increased. You know, it's a, we're the only uh, liberal democracy that doesn't recognise the First Peoples in their constitution. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's a concern. Meanwhile, the Closing the Gap targets meant to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians are slipping. Only five of the 19 targets are on track. Even as King Charles, Australia's head of state, visits the country to meet Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives, he's not expected to speak about the voice referendum. And so Australia's reckoning with its past and its future remains unresolved. True reconciliation will only happen when the nation recognises and confronts the harm it's done and takes meaningful steps to heal. But of course, Australia's struggle with this issue is just one small part of a global story. By the time Charles was four years old and his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, was crowned in 1952, Britain still had more than 70 overseas territories to its name. This doesn't include nations like India, Pakistan, modern-day Myanmar, the end of British control in Palestine, and many others following World War II. And this is all in the lifetime of many who still make decisions in this world and still carry the scars of their legacy. Curiously, the last word that sums up this point is best delivered by none other than King Charles himself. I want to acknowledge that the roots of our contemporary association run deep into the most painful period of our history. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many, as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. If we are to forge a common future that benefits all our citizens, we too must find ways, new ways, to acknowledge our past. Quite simply, this is a conversation whose time has come. A conversation whose time has finally come. And that's what we'll talk about more in part two of this look at the British royal visit to Australia and the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Samoa. For more of our coverage, including content on the upcoming US election and other major topics shaping our world, head to 360info.org. You can sign up for our newsletters and newswire for journalists and understand our work to fight against misinformation with university experts worldwide. This episode of Leave It to the Experts was produced by Michael Joyner, Reese Hooker and Lachlan Gaselli. Researched by Flynn Gary, Music by Jan Skubaszewski at Red Moon Studios. I'm your host, Emma Hoy. See you next time.